For this stone, studied for a BA in Geography at Cam Cambridge University between 1993 and 96. He then volunteered with the land rights campaign, The Land is Ours, before embarking on a PhD. Featherstone has lectured in human geography at the University of Liverpool between 2003 and January 2009. And from February 2009, he has been a lecturer in human geography at the University of Glasgow. And his latest major book is titled Solidarity, Hidden Histories and Geographies of Internationalism, published in 2012. David. Thanks, Casper, and thanks for inviting me. And I kind of want to say, firstly, um, how much of an honor it is to speak here as part of this conference, but also to speak in the tradition of Willy Munzensberg and that great kind of anti-fascist, anti-colonial kind of internationalist tradition. And I also want to kind of preface my remarks by saying that although I've done a lot of work around solidarity and internationalism, my core interest hasn't been Munzensberg, so, and there are people here who know a lot more about him than me, so I'm going to touch on Munzensberg, but I'm not going to pretend to kind of engage that directly with him, because there are people here who will be doing that. But I think what I will try and do over the next sort of half an hour or so is sketch out some of the kind of terrain, intellectual terrain of thinking about different ways of thinking about solidarity, but particularly about thinking about the relationships between anti-fascism and anti-colonialism, which, as we've already heard, are uh, very much in a, a core concern of Munzensberg, but also have, as we've also heard, a kind of have important contemporary resonances, which I'll draw out towards the end of the talk. So I want to start with um, a little extract from an interview with the Trinidadian, the, the great Trinidadian intellectual, um, kind of Marxist, anti-colonial figure, cricket writer, uh, C.L.R. James. And C.L.R. James was interviewed by Al Richardson, the, the British Trotskyist, and Anna Grimshaw in the mid-1980s. He was born in 1901, so this is very much towards the end, end of his life, a couple of years. And the, the kind of, the key in, engagement in the interview is with his recollections of the Trotskyist movement in, the, in Britain in the 30s. But he also makes these very interesting remarks about um, seafarers and maritime laborers and their roles in the kind of Pan-African movement that he was part of. And so Al Richardson asks him in the interview about whether organizations like the International African Service Bureau, the, one of the kind of pan-African uh, organizations that James was involved with, with another great Trinidadian radical, George Padmore, after Padmore had kind of broken with the Comintern in the early, early 30s. And um, Richardson asks him about whether they had smuggled literature into the then colonial world. And James responded as follows. We tried always. We couldn't get in normally because many of those colonial governments and those that came in afterwards were quite hostile to us. But we had one or two people who worked on the waterfront. They gave the pamphlets to seamen and people in boats. In that way, it went around. And Anna Grimshaw kind of pushes him and says, was it people like Chris Jones? And he notes that Chris Jones was a very fine comrade. Chris would get himself into a temper and explode and make a revolution at the back of the hall. But he was able to get the pamphlets and make contacts and people would send it around. We got it around, to my astonishment and delight. After all, we were but a few intellectuals in London and could not have done much. So what I want to kind of start in this talk by thinking about is, is what, what do we take from this kind of rare moment of, of political modesty on the part of James? James was kind of pretty hubristic figure. He kind of rarely kind of gave a sense of the, the significance of kind of others in these kind of big networks in the, in the way he does here. And I think there's perhaps 
three things that I want to kind of take, take from this and then kind of develop into the talk. And firstly, one thing that's all, already been kind of raised, I think, which is who gets kind of remembered, who gets presenced within kind of histories of the kind of radical left internationalist politics. Because I think one of the things that's interesting here is that Anna Grimshaw very much has to kind of push James to talk about Jones. Chris Jones was a Barbatian seafarer from Barbados who came to Britain via New York. And he was a very kind of pivotal, pivotal figure in both anti-colonial organizing, but also the organizing of kind of what were then termed, I guess, colonial seafarers. I'll talk about him more in the paper, in the, in the bulk of the paper. But, and he also contributed a wonderful column, Seaman's Notes, to um, the paper of the International African Service Bureau, um, which uh, International African Opinion. He co contributed this column, which gave a sense of Seaman's kind of the struggles of, and organizing practices of kind of particularly kind of West African and Caribbean seafarers in, in the kind of 30s and 40s. And um, Christian Hobsburg, the kind of great uh, Jamesian scholar from, from uh, based in, in the north of England, has uh, written a great little pamphlet on Jones, but he's got this, um, he's collected all these um, c columns together and they make kind of wonderful kind of reading. So firstly, I think one thing that's important here is that James has to be pushed to talk about Jones because Grimshaw obviously knew about these networks. She, he, he kind of, she questions him, gets him to talk about um, Jones. So there's this kind of sense of a figure who might be kind of, who has often been kind of rendered pretty marginal in spaces of kind of, in histories of kind of Pan-African thought, but here we get this kind of tantalizing glimpse of him because Grimshaw is willing to kind of push James about him. And I think, in that sense, I think this raises a whole set of questions about the kind of subalternity and the production of left internationalism. Here we have a kind of subaltern, kind of pretty subaltern figure who is, whose subalternity is reproduced by being pretty much erased from a lot of the kind of histories of Pan-Africanism. And I think this raises challenges to think about who we presence, how, and why. And in that sense, I think it's also important whilst remembering Munzensburg also to think about what terms which, on which we excavate and think about these kind of major, major figures like Munzensburg or James. Secondly, I think through the engagement with uh, this sense of the pivotal role of seafarers like Jones in circulating pa papers like the um, International African Opinion or earlier in the decade papers like The Negro Worker, there's a very strong sense of the kind of processes of kind of making internationalism and making solidarities. These are not kind of fixed processes that just happen in terms of rarefied, abstracted processes of kind of intellectual engagement, but they are kind of made, they are forged by these kind of practices and activities. And the kind of, the fact that people like Jones and others were kind of willing to smuggle um, and, uh, um, and circulate pamphlets and papers that were kind of banned in, in kind of colonies like Trinidad. And then thirdly, I think, although it's kind of not referenced directly here, but one of the kind of major campaigns that Jones and James worked on together was the, um, the struggles against Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia in 1935. And, um, and that's one of the things that uh, James is referring to, to here when he says that we, we got it around. We got these kind of this, this information around. But more than that, as we'll see later in the paper, figures like uh, Jones, um, Harry O'Connell, the uh, seafarer in Cardiff, were important in preventing um, Italian vessels from being loaded they kind of blacked their supplies. So they kind of had a very direct impact on the kind of circulation of these, um, of, of these kind of colonial kind of networks. And by doing so, very much articulated a kind of anti-fascist, anti-colonialism, which was also, in terms of Jones's terms, very much directly linked in with an engagement with the kind of solidarity, with the kind of struggles 
of um, kind of seafarers who of particularly Asian and uh, black British seafarers working in the British Merchant Marine under really kind of horrendous kind of conditions of kind of oppression, both from the, the mainstream labor unions, but also and, and, and from employers. So um, what I want to do in this talk is briefly sketch out some of what I think are a kind of an important but often quite, I think, neglected set of engagements between anti-fascism and anti-colonialism at work in the writings of figures like George Padmore and C.L.R. James. I then want to kind of think a little bit about why some of those traditions have been kind of, perhaps, perhaps silence is too strong a word, but marginalized, rendered less present in debates about kind of fascism or anti-fascism, both on the left, but also particularly thinking about the pressures of the right in shutting down debates about the memory of anti-fascism. And then I want to kind of think about um, some of these, sort of, some of the organizing spaces that people like Munzensburg created and how they kind of shaped these kinds of exchanges that led to these engagements between anti-fascism and anti-colonialism. And, uh, and then I want to kind of look uh, again at some of these struggles against um, the invasion of Ethiopia and then link to kind of contemporary um, debates um, very briefly at the end. So writing in the journal Controversy in 1938, uh, George Padmore, uh, the Trinidadian anti-colonial activist who I've mentioned, who by this time was working outside of the spaces of the Communist International. He, in the late 20s and early 30s, he was one of the kind of pivotal, pivotal figures in communist uh, international anti-colonial work. And Padmore noted that of the, this is talking about the British colonial government, that the government is, an, is inaugurating a policy which savors of colonial fascism, and which, if not challenged immediately, is bound to deprive the workers of their most elementary civil rights, such as freedom of the press, speech, and assembly. And the article was written in, in response to the inter intensification of colonial repression in the Caribbean in, in the wake of the kind of Trinidadian labor rebellions of 1937 to eight, which had intensified this deprivation of workers' elementary civil rights. But what I want to argue here is that um, Padmore, by thinking of these processes as kind of fascism, makes an important set of moves in terms of how we, on the terms on which colonialism and fascism are kind of theorized, articulated, but also contested. And for Padmore, it was necessary to think very critically about the, the kind of role of kind of British colonialism in relationship to fascism. And indeed, one of the reasons he gave for breaking with the Comintern in the early 30s was diktats that he, stating that in his anti-colonial work, he should be, be basically nicer to Britain, France, and just kind of focus his ire on kind of Germany and Italy. And that was something that he wasn't prepared to do. But I think one of the core contributions that Padmore makes here is, and as I'll also argue that figures like James also do, is to irrevocably link fascism to colonialism, to argue that it's impossible to kind of understand fascism without thinking about it in relationship to kind of processes of colonialism. And I'd argue that this is part of an under-acknowledged under, and under-appreciated set of interventions by black internationalist intellectuals, both within, outside, and perhaps beyond the communist international in shaping articulations of anti-fascism and anti-colonialism. And as Susan Pennebacher has argued in, in her book from Scottsboro to Munich, this work was done in sharp distinction to those who advocated the liberation of the colonial world and continued to do so up to and after the declaration of war in Europe, most anti-fascists saw the struggle against fascist rule in Italy, Spain, and Germany, and subsequently the territories invaded by the Axis powers as their primary central focus. They would not have entertained Padmore's slogan, hands off 
the colonies. So for um, Pennebacher, what's important about figures like um, Padmore is the way they articulate these relationships between fascism and colonialism. And in through doing so, I think, make a number of contributions to the ways in which anti-fascism was articulated. So firstly, there's this kind of irrevocable sense that anti-fascism becomes articulated through the kind of diverse geographies of opposition to colonialism. And in this sense, fascism is seen as something which comes out of a colonial experience. In this sense, um, Claudia Jones, the, um, the great, um, another kind of great important Trinidadian figure, saw kind of processes of kind of ra racism as um, constructed through imperialism. She argued in the West Indian Gazette that it preaches the superiority of the white race whose destiny it is to rule over those with colored skins and to treat with them with contempt. It is the ideology which breeds fascism, rightly condemned by the civilized people of the whole world. So for figures like Claudia Jones, it was impossible to understand fascism without locating it in relationship to these kind of processes of colonialism. Also, C.L.R. James, I think, is a, an, again, James has been celebrated for, for, for many different kind of contributions, but I think one of the kind of neglected contributions of books like The Black Jacobins, and also, but also some of his more uh, kind of, his journalism through the kind of late 30s and early 40s, is a kind of particular way of understanding the relationships between anti-fascism and anti-colonialism. Thus, kind of writing in December 1939 in an essay, Revolution in the Negro, which was published in the New International, James compared African Americans who'd volunteered to fight in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, or what's become kind of generally known as the Abraham Lincoln Brigade in the, the International Brigades, to the Haitian revolutionaries, Rigo and Beauvais. He notes that they had both volunteered to fight in America tempering their swords against the enemy abroad for use against the enemy at home. So there's a kind of a usable past emerges both in this specific essay of James, but also I think more broadly in the Black Jacobins, which links anti-fascism and anti-colonialism. And I think in one way, and that's very much signaled by that kind of a powerful um, preface to the Black Jacobins where he talks about the... the, the it was in the stillness of a seaside suburb that could be heard most clearly and insistently the booming of Franco's heavy artillery, the rattle of Stalin's firing squads, and the fierce, shrill turmoil of a revolutionary movement striving for clarity and influence. So James also speaks there to, to the struggles against Stalinism and the ways in which Stalinism kind of confined and exerted pressure on the kind of terms on which... Um, anti-fascism was kind of articulated and kind of very much anti-fascism often became allied to a certain kind of nationalist politics in the kind of in popular front terms. James also, and again this is something that he does in various places in the Black Jacobins and other writings, also talks very much about the kind of racialized dimensions of fascism. So um, in modern politics, he argued that Hitler's conception of the master race had originated in colonialism, and he writes that San Domingo passed a series of laws which for maniacal savagery are unique in the middle world, in the modern world, and we would have had said up to 1933, not likely to be paralleled again in history. So intellectuals like James and Padmore are engaging in various ways with the kind of terms on struggles to kind of think about and shape a kind of anti-fascism which is anti-colonial and kind of which shapes the kind of geographical imaginations it develops. And I think one of the kind of puzzles in some ways which we might think about in this conference is why those attempts to really think about anti-fascism and anti-colonialism together have been so kind of marginal. And I think one... I think challenge in terms of thinking about anti-fascism is the kind of uh, pressure of the political right, 
in closing down a space for recovering, asserting the importance of anti-fascist struggles, particularly, I think, in the contemporary context in Italy and Spain. Helen Graham's book on the Spanish Civil War in the uh, 20th, in the kind of long 20th century gives a kind of really strong sense of the extent to which the, um, which the Spanish right has been successful in, in closing down discussion of um, anti-fascism from the kind of Spanish public sphere. But I think there's also problems in terms of kind of left approaches to kind of histories and geographies of radicalism, which have often sought to kind of confine our kind of historical traditions within a kind of nationed spaces. So certainly in the kind of context where, where uh, in, in the kind of the British context, perhaps one of the most defining aspects of this is a text like E.P. Thompson's magisterial English, Making the English Working Class, which is kind of wonderful book about kind of popular agency, but which irrevocably confines that popular agency within the space of the nation. Um, and this has kind of perhaps shaped how we think about various kind of figures, both, um, and Richard Iton's wonderful book, uh, The Black Fantastic, talks critically about attempts to confine Paul Robeson within US national spaces. And he argues that the maps that might help us trace the connections between the pre and post Robeson uh, moments do not exist, leaving the rather overpowering silence that has marked the borders and boundaries of the popular front era and classic southern-based civil rights era politics. And he argues that um, Robeson, after his death, in kind of particularly in black radical politics in the States, was revived and recuperated in terms that disarticulated black politics and internationalism while treading the safer waters of manhood rights. Robson, Robson would, in the decades after his death, function as a race man containable within the borders of a postage stamp. So we take this kind of great internationalist kind of figure like Robson and kind of shrink him um, into this kind of as Iten says, there's a kind of space uh, of a, a postage stamp. Elsewhere, Peter Leinbauer and Marcus Frederick have talked about conf confining political movements within the kind of spaces of kind of national cemetery plots. So, and Robeson himself remarked in a um, conversation with the Cuban poet Nicolas Guian in Spain that it is not only as an artist that I love the cause of democracy in Spain, but also as a black, I belong to an oppressed race, discriminated against, one that could not live if fascism triumphed in, in the world. That this conversation took place with Guian in Spain signals the importance of the transnational terrain on which such anti-fascist and anti-colonial solidarities were articulated and envisioned. And another kind of figure who is kind of, he's one of the kind of figures whose names dotting around, um, Nehru also travelled to Spain and Robeson told a rally for the cause of Free India at New York's Manhattan Centre in September 42 that his interest in India went back to the 30s when he had met Nehru and his sister in London after touring Spain with Krishna Menon, the dominant force in the Indian, in, Indian League. And he had found we had much in common. So how might we go about reconstructing maps of kind of politics that allow us to think about the kind of terrain in which different um, struggles are articulated, such as these that um, um, Robeson speaks to in ways which articulate different struggles, different anti-colonial struggles, but also often within the spaces of kind of metropolitan countries like um, France, the US, and Spain. And w one kind of figure who I think can very much help us to do this is thinking through some of the contributions of Billy Munzensberg. And what I want to argue is, it, 
um, is that the kinds of spaces that Munzensberg was cr creating were absolutely fundamental to enabling these kinds of exchanges that we just heard about to take place. So writing in the Anti-Imperial Review in 1928 as a, a kind of... A, writing reflections on the first uh, League Against Imperialism conference in 1928, he argued that the first great demonstration of the oppressed peoples that he describes the, the first congress as the first great demonstration of the oppressed peoples that was really comprehensive in character. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, you can actually probably read it for yourselves anyway. Um, so, um, so he's, he saw this great demonstration of oppressed peoples as really comprehensive in character and lasting in its effects. And I think, and he brings, one of the things he draws out is the kind of diverse political trajectories that are kind of brought together. And he, I, he talks about 200 delegates coming from all parts of the globe, and he argues, in somewhat disingenuous terms, that it almost seemed if in India and China, African and America, millions of people had been waiting for this, the signal, the sense that they just happened, happened to come together without the kind of resources that Munzensberg brought to bear. But I think it speaks to some of the kind of ways in which Munzensberg's kind of political innovation and political skill to draw these kinds of um, polit politics together. And but also not just to do that, but to think about the terms on which it was done. And James Maxton, one of the iconic figures of Red Clydeside in Glasgow, argued before he was kind of elbowed out of the League Against Imperialism by, for, for being a non-communist, that uh, the League Against Imperialism provided an organization within which the peoples of the oppressing and oppressed nations can meet on common ground and pursue in common the task of emancipation. So what was crucial for um, Maxton was the kind of terms on which these conversations were happening, was that the League Against Imperialism shaped articulations between different left voices and actors, but on at least aspiring to kind of terms of equality. And I think one of the kind of interesting things is also some of the kind of connections that were enabled by these conferences. So Brent Hayes Edwards notes in his discussion of the collaboration between George Padmore and the West African labor organizer Timoko Garan Kiyate that they, they first met at the second congress of the League Against Imperialism in Frankfurt in July 1929. So these spaces were incredibly kind of productive of different kind of left internationalist politics. They also arguably perhaps retained a rather kind of elite character um, and in, in a sense the organizations like for example the Colonial Siemens Association in Britain open up that, uh, that Chris Jones was president of shaped perhaps a kind of articulation of this kind of left anti-colonial internationalism, which is much more grounded in particular labor struggles. The Colonial Siemens Association was formed in 1935 as, as part of a response to attempts to kind of push black and Asian seafarers out of the labor market in British bought cities. And, but you also get a strong sense of the kind of diverse trajectories that came together here. So Chris Jones was one of the founders together with Surat Ali, an Indian labor organizer who was, um, unlike people like Krishna Manon, very kind of firmly allied with the Communist Party at various times. Arnold Ward, another kind of Barbados-born uh, seafarer, five minutes, um, was also significant. And to link back to the struggles against um, Ethiopia, uh, against the invasion of Ethiopia, um, Surat Ali reported, um, speaking at the first conference of the Colonial Siemens Association in 1936, that the association was started at the time 
when Italian fascism threatened to attack Abyssinia, the association was the expression of the discontent existing among the colonial seamen, and its aim was to redress their grievances. So we have a sense here of a kind of various subaltern groups be, being articulated both in terms of struggles against around labor, but also struggles against kind of fascism. And so briefly, before I conclude, um, just to kind of signal, I think, the importance of Munzensburg in the ways in which we kind of think about the terms in which anti-colonialism and anti-fascism might be articulated together. Susan Pennybacker argues that for the Scottsboro campaigners, the anti-fascist militants and the Reichstag trial defendants advocates who were still alive in a position to hear of his passing, Munzensburg was someone who had supplied enough funds, enough spirit, and enough inspiration at various moments in the 1930s to be mourned. And this speaks then, if we kind of speak about mourning, to thinking about how we kind of take forward uh, the struggles for a kind of left internationalist solidarity in the kind of current, current times. And in his powerful 1978 essay, Racism in Reaction, Stuart Hall comments that race can function as a key lens through which people come to perceive that a crisis is developing and, and can be through the framework and can be the framework through which the crisis is experienced. I think particularly coming from, from Britain, I think the kind of racialization of the kind of post-2008 crisis, whether it be in relationship to ongoing debates about uh, kind of migrants, but also in relationship to the kind of really divisive languages in which different parts of Europe have been set against each other through the, um, the rhetoric of those in favor of austerity really kind of need to be challenged. And I think in this sense, some of the left, I think, has, has amplified some of the kind of ways in which these divisive and frequently racialized constructions of crisis have been articulated. Um, so, um, the, so, Bertolt Huber, uh, General, then General Secretary of the IG Metal, gave a speech in 2012, which demonstrates some of the pressures on formation of solidarities across the socio-spatial divisions of contemporary Europe. Andreas and uh, Bieler and Roland Earn note in last year's Socialist Register that he first blamed Spanish unions for the fate of the Spanish economy for them having obtained too high wage increases and that they were responsible for undermining the competitiveness of Spanish economies. But I think one of the opportunities of the current moment that kind of linking back to some of the kind of comments at the start is for articulations of solidarity to be produced which fundamentally undermine these kind of divisions between North and South Europe that have been so powerfully rhetorically um, used to bolster austerity um, practices by kind of figures like George Osborne. And, and I think in this sense, the, one of the kind of exciting things about the emergence of kind of movements like Podemos and Syriza, however kind of difficult the Syriza kind of experience is, is the ways in which that's kind of energizing kind of solidarities across Europe for practices of um, oppositional kind of solidarity, but showing the kind of also the possible and potential for articulating a different kind of European political kind of project, one shaped by solidarity and kind of left values rather than by the kind of divisive nasty kind of rhetoric that uh, we've seen from kind of those who are kind of key proponents of austerity. And in this sense, the, um, also the, I think the election of, of Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn in, as kind of the leader of the Labour Party also shows that kind of that potential for, for those, those movements to kind of spread, but also the kind of the ways in which they've change the terms of political debate. The, the idea that Corbyn would get elected 
as leader of the Labour Party, has absolutely stunned the British political establishment. They can't believe that it's happened. And, and, I, think, and I think as exciting as Corbyn getting elected is also the kind of broader political momentum around him, that it's, that, which is the movement that he's kind of come to kind of power, not come to power, but come to kind of be elected on the back of. So... Uh, I will, I will finish on that no, happy note that uh, there's a kind of, at least a kind of di potential for diverse articulations of solidarity which will undermine the, the divisions that austerity thrives on. The austerity uh, Thank you.